Alright, good evening. Welcome to the Sunday evening services of True Vine Baptist Church. On behalf of Pastor David Gibson and all the folks of True Vine, we're happy that you've tuned in tonight and we pray that the service will be a blessing to you this evening. And so uh, let's uh, go ahead and take our hymn books tonight. We are in the Red Hymn Book, uh, Great Hymns of the Faith. And the first song we're going to sing tonight is Rescue the Perishing. And so if you don't have this particular hymn book, uh, you can either look up the lyrics online or you can use your own hymn book. But we're going to sing Rescue the Perishing, which in this book is hymn number 432. 432. And so let's all prepare to sing. Here we go on the first. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting. Waiting the penitent child to receive. 
plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, cords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it, strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them, tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Amen. Praise the Lord for the opportunity to lift up the, the Lord's name in praise and in song. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Our Father in God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Father, we thank you that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Lord, thank you for the Word of God that tells us of these things. And Lord, thank you for the sweet, abiding presence of your Holy Spirit that dwells within us, dear God, that brings peace and comfort even in troublesome times. Lord, we uh, are, are perplexed uh, as far as uh, uh, everything that's going on around us with regards to this uh, coronavirus and uh, how it's changed the way of life, at least temporarily here in America. And Father, we just pray for your grace and for your mercy. Uh, Father, we pray that things can settle down and that things can get back to normal at some point. Father, we do pray for those that have uh, 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 been afflicted by this disease as far as being sick. We pray for their recovery. Uh, we pray for the families of those that have lost their loved ones uh, to this virus, that you might provide peace and comfort to their hearts. And Lord, we pray for the health care workers that are on the front lines taking care of those that are sick and afflicted, uh, working long hours, dear Lord. And Father, risking their own health and welfare uh, for the sake of others. Please watch over them and bless them. We pray for the president. We pray for the vice president. We pray for the Surgeon General and the physicians that are advising them. We pray for each of the 50 state governors, Lord, as far as uh, the way in which they uh, take care of their states. And Father, we just pray that you would uh, uh, handle this situation according to your will. And Father, help us to have trust and confidence in you. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. And Father, we just pray, God, that you would bless our service tonight, bless the songs we sing, uh, bless these prayers that are offered up and sacrificed to you. And Lord, most importantly, please bless the preaching of your word. And Father, we pray for anyone that's listening tonight. Uh, Lord, we pray whether they're saved or lost, the Lord, you would speak to the special need of their heart through the word of God this evening. And Father, we'll thank you, we'll love you, and we'll praise you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning in to our evening broadcast. Uh, I was invited by Pastor Gibson to lead the evening service uh, this morning. Brother Byron uh, uh, had pre-taped or pre-recorded uh, uh, a lesson from the Gospel of Matthew for Sunday School. And then Associate Pastor uh, Jimmy Flasky uh, preached uh, the morning message. And so now it's, uh, it's my turn this evening. And so it's an honor uh, to be with you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I realize that there's other things you could be doing right now. And so we are very grateful that you've tuned into this broadcast. And we hope that the Lord might bless you for it. Amen. All right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, sing our next uh, song here. If I can get it pulled up for us here. Um, in the red hymn book here, it's going to be hymn number 308 which is Higher Ground, Higher Ground, 308, 308, and here we go. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher 
pasture plain than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. But faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than i have found lord plant my feet on higher ground i want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright but still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to do one more tonight. And our final hymn of the evening will be hymn number 500, hymn number 500 in the Red Hymn Book, Great Hymns of the Faith. And this is going to be When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. You know, uh, someday soon Jesus is coming back. Uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again uh, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Uh, the author of Hebrews, uh, the Apostle Paul, tells us, Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And so we look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we uh, go through these uh, troublesome times, these trying times, uh, it seems to me uh, more than ever uh, that the Lord is closer and at the door. And so, but someday soon the roll is going to be called up yonder. I pray that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life so that when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there. Amen? Hymn number 500. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Before the master from the dawn till setting sun, let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all the life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Well, it's kind of like I said last week, uh, uh, the Bible says that it needs to be a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. Doesn't mean it has to sound, uh, sound good. <laughs> so, <laughs> I appreciate y'all uh, bearing with me there as far as uh, through that singing. And so, uh, but now we'll get to the most important part uh, of the service, and that's the preaching of the Word of God. And so if you have your Bibles ready, uh, let's take them and come over to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We'll be preaching from the New Testament tonight. Matthew chapter 4. And uh, once again, I just uh, praise God for the technology that uh, allows us to do uh, what we're doing tonight. Um, obviously, uh, all of us would, uh, would much rather uh, be in church, uh, fellowshipping uh, in person. And so uh, this certainly can't take the place of that. Uh, but uh, at least uh, through this technology, we do have the means to be able to fellowship together uh, in some uh, manner, shape, or form. And so praise the Lord for that. All right, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give unto thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me, then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, this story of the temptation of Christ at the hands of the devil is told three times in the four Gospels. Uh, Matthew, of course, as we just read, records this story as does uh, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Mark only spends one short verse on this narrative, and then John does not mention it at all. And so between Matthew and Luke, that's where we find the bulk of the information uh, of this story. Now, of course, in this story, the Lord Jesus Christ is being tempted. And as a man, he could be tempted. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, God, as a spirit, cannot be tempted. But when God took upon human form, when God became a man, God could then be tempted. The Bible says that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God became a man. Uh, God as a spirit could not get hungry. But we see in our text tonight that God as a man could get hungry. Uh, God as a spirit could not get thirsty, but God as a man could get thirsty. Uh, God as a spirit could not become weary, but God as a man could become weary. And then, of course, ultimately, God as a spirit could not die, but God as a man not only could die, but he did die. And so Jesus here faces temptation as the God-man. Uh, in theology, sometimes you'll hear the term the hypostatic union. 
And what that refers to is, is the marriage of divinity and with humanity and the joining of it together in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In the person of Jesus Christ, you had the complete Godhead. Now, in this chapter, Jesus is being tempted. And what's interesting about that is you and I know a little bit about temptation as well. For every single one of us has encountered temptation. Notice, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Bible tells us, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And so every single one of us understands what it's like to be tempted. But you know what? Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, he likewise understood what it meant to be tempted. Notice, if you will, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now notice there in verse 15 that says that he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted just like you and I are tempted. The difference is this, where you and I fail, Jesus Christ prevailed. Now, what are these points of temptation? What are these points of temptation? Uh, take your Bible and come over to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, we find this. 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So notice, Jesus was tempted at all points like as we, yet without sin. And those points are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And listen, that's no different than what the first human beings were tempted with all the way back in Genesis. Take your Bibles for a moment, if you will, and come to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, you know the story. Uh, God has planted a garden. Uh, he's charged Adam uh, with basically being the caretaker or the husbandman uh, of this garden. Uh, he's planted trees throughout this garden, and he's given the man one simple commandment. Uh, look at verse uh, 16, 216. Well, back up to verse 15 for context. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And so there's God's commandment to Adam. Then it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Uh, that shows that Adam was created with intelligence. Uh, he wasn't some uh, caveman uh, grunting uh, with a, a nonsensical speech, uh, rubbing sticks together trying to create fire. Uh, Adam was created with 
full intellect and intelligence to the point that he could name all the living creatures. Now, verse 21, the first surgery in human history takes place. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And so uh, God takes this rib from Adam, and from this rib he creates Eve, or the first woman. Now, listen, uh, he could have uh, uh, taken any bone in his body, but he took a rib. Why? Because the rib is that bone that is closest to the heart. And what does Paul tell us in Ephesians chapter 5? He says, husbands love your wives. And so he takes uh, the rib, that bone closest to the heart, and from that heart he forms the woman. And Adam said, verse 23, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So things are going great until chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Uh, notice that the first time the devil ever speaks, he speaks with a question, and the purpose of the question is to cast doubt on what God said. Not only that, nearly every time he speaks in Scripture, he speaks with a question because he's always trying to cast doubt. When we get back to, back to Matthew chapter 4, we'll find out that he says, If thou be the Son of God, as though there were any question. And so Satan always likes to cast doubt. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now Eve's in trouble already because she's omitted a key word. Notice back in verse 16 of chapter 2, God said, Thou mayest freely eat. You see, Eve, when she quotes God here, she leaves out the word freely. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. She should have said, We may freely eat. Don't think the devil doesn't recognize when you don't know your Bible. He does. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Uh, notice, uh, first Eve takes away from what God said. She omits the word freely. Now she adds something that God didn't even say. She says, Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God never said you couldn't touch it. He just said, Don't eat of it. Now, what probably happened, and I'm just giving you some speculation here, uh, Adam, when he communicates what God said to Eve, he probably threw that in there. Uh, look, Eve, uh, we can eat of any tree of the garden except that one right there. Uh, listen here, honey, uh, don't even touch it. So that's probably where she got that. I don't know. Bottom line is, she is first subtracted from the Word of God. Now she's added to the Word of God. And by doing so, the devil knows he's got her exactly where he wants her. And you know what? When you add to the Word of God and when you subtract from the Word of God, the devil knows he's got you where he wants you to. And so notice this. Verse 5. God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see, that's how the devil works. Uh, he starts off by trying to cast doubt on the authority of what God said, but now, when he sees Eve doesn't even know her Bible, uh, now he's openly challenging and defying what God said. Uh, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, uh, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Uh, notice the devil goes from casting doubt to open defiance, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to make Eve think, you know what, God's holding back the good stuff from you, Eve. He's holding down on you. Uh, he's keeping things back from you that you deserve and you have a right to. Look at the next verse, verse 6. And notice all three points of temptation. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
good for food. Well, there's your lust of the flesh. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. Pleasant to the eyes. Well, there's your lust of the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. Make one wise. There's your pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. My friends, right there is the entrance of sin into this world. And do you know what followed sin? Death. The Bible says, for by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so then death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see, God lays the blame at Adam's feet, not Eve. Because the difference is this. We're told by the Apostle Paul that the serpent deceived or beguiled the woman through his subtlety. He tricked her. He deceived her. Uh, Adam, though, willingly defied what God told him. And whether it was for the sake of his wife or whatever the motivation may have been, Adam knew what God said and Adam disobeyed it. And so we see the three points of temptation, though. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what the very first humans were tempted with. That's what you and I are tempted with. And that's what Jesus himself was tempted with. Yet, whereas Adam and Eve failed, whereas you and I have failed for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Where all of us have failed, Jesus, the Christ, has prevailed. How did he do it? Matthew chapter 4 demonstrates, if you'll turn back there. Matthew chapter 4. This evening, with the help of the Lord, I'd like to speak on this subject for a few moments. Triumph over temptation. Triumph over temptation. Do you ever get tired of going back to God and having to confess the same sins over and over again. I know that I do. You know, I'm so grateful that the Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm glad that God is a gracious and merciful God that forgives sin. I just wish I didn't have to ask for forgiveness so much. How about you? You know, temptation is common to us all. Um, you know, I told you to come to Matthew 4. Uh, notice, if you will, James chapter 1. Let me show you James chapter 1, because I don't want you to miss out on this. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, come to verse 12. James chapter 1, verse 12. In James chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says this, Blessed is the man, or happy is the man, that endureth temptation. For when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Do you see that? Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Well, we seem to have a contradiction. Because in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, it says that God did tempt Abraham. But here's the key. In James, it says that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, by implication, with evil. God can tempt in the sense of trial and testing. God can tempt as far as testing your faith. But God will never tempt a man to do evil. That's what the devil does. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. 
And so uh, there is a process to temptation. There is a process. And when you understand the process, then you can start to take steps to deal effectively with the temptation. And that's exactly what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4, and we'll get there just shortly. But notice this, in uh, uh, verse uh, 13 to 16, or really 12 to 16 here in James chapter 1, uh, we see uh, what we call the addictive cycle as far as sin. Uh, in verse 13, we see uh, preoccupation. Uh, when no man, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he uh, any man. And so, uh, basically, what we mean by preoccupation is the presentation. You see, you can be presented with sin, but being presented with sin is not sin. Jesus was presented with sin. And so, uh, you can have the presentation. Um, you can have illumination. Presentation, you're presented with it. Illumination... You have understanding or enlightenment that that's sin. Those two things are fine. Presentation, illumination, we have no problem. The problem is when we enter into contemplation. When you move from presentation to illumination to contemplation, that's where you begin to have problems. You know, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, it talks about uh, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Well, what if he never goes so far as to have physical adultery with her? Has he still committed adultery? According to Jesus, yes. Absolutely. Because presentation, illumination, but when lust creeps in, it's now contemplation. Uh, probably one of the best examples in the Bible is David. Uh, David stays home from battle when he's supposed to be out there at war like the rest of the kings. And he hangs back in garrison, uh, goes up to the rooftop at night, and he uh, stares down and he sees this woman in Bathsheba uh, bathing herself. Uh, he sees this naked woman, basically, and uh, uh, he has the presentation of sin. He has the illumination of sin. But where he really starts to have problems is contemplation. Let me say something to you. David was in trouble before he ever touched her because he had lusted after her in his heart already. And so after presentation, illumination, contemplation, then comes decision. You see, when you contemplate about what you're going to do, you're already in trouble. And even if you decide not to do it, the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. And so we can sin by our thoughts, not just by our words and by our deeds, but also by our thoughts. And so uh, contemplation leads to decision, and then ultimately decision leads to action. And so it started off with illumination. It led to, or excuse me, presentation, rather. It started off with presentation, then it went to illumination, uh, then it went to contemplation, then it went to decision, and then finally it ends up with action. So he says here, uh, verse uh, uh, 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. There's contemplation. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, action, or, or excuse me, a decision and action. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brother. Five steps to temptation. Presentation, illumination, contemplation, decision, action. Jesus experienced presentation. He experienced illumination. But he never, ever got to contemplation, decision, and action. Let's take our Bibles and come back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 1 again. Then was Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So notice Spirit there is capitalized. And so uh, that shows us it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. Now 40 days and 40 nights, the number 40 in the Bible, uh, that's the number of judgment. Uh, that's the number of trial. 
and testing. Uh, it rained upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights in the days of Noah. Uh, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Saul reigned over Israel for 40 years. David reigned over Israel for 40 years. Solomon reigned over Israel for 40 years. Uh, 40, it's God's number of testing and trial and judgment. And so here, the Lord Jesus is being tested. He's being tried for 40 days and for 40 nights. And afterwards, he's in hunger. Now, uh, he's the third person in the Bible to fast for 40 days and for 40 nights. Uh, the first person was Moses. Uh, when Moses was up in the mount with God, uh, receiving uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, we're told in Exodus 34, 28, that he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. Uh, listen, Elijah, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8, when he went to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, where Moses had been, uh, the Bible says that he continued in the strength of the food God provided for 40 days and 40 nights. So Moses and Elijah, who, by the way, are the two witnesses of the tribulation, they fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and here Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 3, and when the tempter came, notice the tempter. Who's the tempter? The devil, from verse 1. So notice God is not the tempter. He never tempts any man with evil. But Satan, the devil, he is the tempter. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And so notice uh, back in Genesis chapter 3, uh, Satan says, Yea, hath God said? Uh, you come over to Job chapter 1 verse 9. Uh, he says, Doth Job fear God for naught? And then here you come to Matthew chapter 1 verse 3. And he says, uh, uh, If thou be the Son of God. Notice, every time the devil shows up, he's speaking in questions and trying to cause doubt. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, bear in mind, he's talking to someone that's fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. The average Baptist can't uh, fast for 40 minutes, 40 hours, much less 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine how hungry Jesus is after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and the tempter shows up and says, hey, if, if you're the son of God, if you really are who you say you are, then take one of these stones and turn it into a nice, juicy buttermilk biscuit with gravy. <laughs> you can't have a biscuit without gravy. If you're going to have biscuits, you got to have gravy. And if you're not going to have gravy, why would you bother having biscuits? And so, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, notice, Jesus is hungry. He's fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's being tempted to turn a stone into bread. Of the points of temptation, which one do you think that might be? Well, beyond any shadow of a doubt, it's the lust of the flesh. Probably every cell of his body is screaming out, Feed me! He's hungry! And listen here. Do you think that he had the power to do what Satan has tempted him to do? Sure he did. Uh, we're talking about someone that was able to give uh, sight to the blind. Uh, we're talking about someone that was able to give hearing to the deaf. Uh, we're talking about someone that was able to raise people up from the dead, even though they've been dead for four days. Uh, we're talking about someone that was able to turn water into wine. Uh, we're talking about someone that could feed uh, 5,000 men plus their wives and children with five loaves of bread and two fishes. We're talking about a fellow that could walk walk on water. We're talking about someone that can stand up in the back of the boat in the midst of a storm and say, peace, be still. And there was peace and everything was still. A person that can do all that, trust me, he has no problems turning a stone into a biscuit. If thou be the Son of God, the lust of the flesh but he answered and said, It is written, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Oh, well, listen here, my friend. It's not just the physical bre bread that sustains your body. You better have the spiritual bread that sustains your soul. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, of course, that's a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. So when Jesus said, it is written, he's quoting scripture. In this case, Deuteronomy 8, 3. Now, what's interesting is if you look over at Luke chapter 4, keep your thumb here, we're coming right back. In Luke chapter 4, the same story is being told. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And Luke chapter 4, verse 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, if you're not reading from the King James Bible tonight, in verse 4, your Bible probably didn't say that. If you're reading the NIV or the NASV or the ESV or the CSV or some other V, uh, the part where it says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, but by every word of God is taken out of your Bible. Now, it may or may not be in a footnote, I don't know. Uh, it may or may not be in the center column reference. The bottom line is, it's not in the text where it belongs. And so, I encourage you with every fiber of my being to stick with the old King James Bible because the King James Bible is the only English Bible that has all the verses in it. And if you're using some other version, that doesn't mean that you're evil. That doesn't mean that you're wicked. doesn't even mean that you're not saved. Uh, I know many, 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 many good, God-fearing people that use other translations. But I want you to have everything that God has for you and in English, that's only available in the King James Bible. Matthew chapter 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Alright, so there's that first temptation. The lust of the flesh. Jesus passes that one with flying colors. Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him down on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now that's interesting, because watch. In the first temptation, Jesus responded with Scripture. So notice in the second temptation, Satan says, fine, if we're going to quote scripture, two can play that game. And so he comes to Jesus and he quotes scripture. And the scripture that he quotes is Psalm 9111. Psalm 9111 and 12. It says, uh, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And so Jesus responded to the first temptation with Scripture, so Satan comes right back at him with Scripture. You know what that shows me? The devil knows the Bible better than I do. The devil knows the Bible better than you do. Oh, don't think the devil doesn't know the Scripture. He knows the Scripture. The problem for the devil is this. He doesn't believe it. He knows it, but he doesn't believe it. And in his twisted, warped mind, he thinks that somehow, some way, he's going to get around what this book said. But he's not going to do it. He's not going to get around what this book said. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Uh, listen here. This book is not going to change. God can't lie. And everything he says will come to pass. And that's true for the devil. And it's true for you. Because some of y'all are just like the devil. You think that you're going to find some way around this book. Uh, you think that you're going to find uh, some means to get around what God said. You're not going to get around it any more than the devil will. You know, someday the devil himself is going to be on both his knees with his hands raised to God, confessing with his tongue 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I can't wait to see it. But you know what? Someday, you're going to be on your knees too. And you're going to raise your hands up to heaven. And you're going to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father also. My hope for you is that's not the last thing you do before you get cast into a lake of fire. Because for some folks, that's going to be the last thing they ever do before God binds them hand and foot and casts them out into outer darkness. And so, the devil here, he comes with scripture. And you know what we see here? We see the pride of life. Because what Satan is trying to do, he's trying to get Jesus to exhibit pride over being the Son of God. Because watch this. Had Jesus jumped off the pinnacle of that temple, do you know what would have happened? The angels would have bore him up. They would have bore him up. But the problem is this. In doing so, he would have exhibited pride over being the Son of God. And as a result, he would have been a sinner just like you and me. And you know what? A sinner can't do anything for another sinner. You know, uh, uh, the reason why Jesus Christ could be the Savior of mankind is because he was without sin. Uh, the Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says that there was no sin, neither was there guile in him. Uh, listen, you can take me out in the front yard tonight and hang me up on a cross and, and pierce both my hands and pierce my feet and put a crown of thorn on, uh, thorns on my head and, and, and stab my side with a spear and thrust me through and all that. You can bleed me like a stuck pig. And that's not going to do one thing for you. You know why? Because I'm a sinner just like you. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so I can't help you. I can't save you. Crucify me all you want to. It won't do you any good. But Jesus was the sinless Lamb of God. He was the substitute that died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day for our justification. And God has regard unto the sinless Son of God. But here we see Jesus being tempted with the pride of life. Uh, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Notice the devil is saying, it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. How does Jesus respond? Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Whoo! <laughs> thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Do you understand what Jesus was saying there? He was like, Satan, you ought not to be tempting God. In essence, what Jesus was saying was that he was God. <laughs> now, the Jehovah Witnesses don't get that. Uh, the Mormons don't get that. The Muslims don't get that. But that's okay. That's what he was saying, nevertheless. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan, you're tempting God. And the scriptures say not to do that. Now, of course, Jesus... As God in the flesh, God the Son, he would have been tempting God the Father if he had jumped off that temple. And so you can take that either of those ways, but of a truth, no doubt, Jesus was affirming his deity. It is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we see the lust of the flesh uh, as far as uh, uh, the, the ability to turn stones into bread. Uh, we see the pride of life, uh, the ability to cast oneself off the pinnacle of the temple and yet be borne up by the angels. But last, we see this, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, 
All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You see, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. That's what the devil has craved from the beginning, and that's what he's ultimately going to get during the tribulation. He wants worship. Notice, if you will, come to Isaiah. Come to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, look at this. Here we find the origin of the devil. Isaiah chapter 14. Look at verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now the NIV in that passage says, How are you fallen from heaven, O morning star? Now that's blasphemous. It's blasphemous. Because Jesus is the bright and morning star according to Revelation 22, 16. And Jesus is not the one who fell. Lucifer is the one who fell. And so only the King James Bible gets this right as far as, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou fallen? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Now watch verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Notice Lucifer's desire is to not only be like God, but to take God's place. He wants his throne to be above God's throne, his stars to be above God's stars. He wants to be like the Most High. And so that's what Satan craves more than anything, worship. And you know, ultimately, he's going to get it. Look over at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. The Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. That's the Antichrist who's being backed up by the devil himself. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? You see, that's been Satan's desire from the beginning. That's what his desire is tonight. That's what his desire was when he tempted Jesus. He wants to be worshipped. And for a short time in human history, during the tribulation, after the church is gone, by the way, he's going to get his wish. But his days are numbered. And so... In Matthew chapter 4, he says, All this will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now notice the unique thing about this passage is that Jesus doesn't challenge the devil's authority to offer these kingdoms. He doesn't say, Oh, Satan, you're lying. Those kingdoms don't even belong to you. No, by omission or by his silence, Jesus acknowledges that these kingdoms do belong to Satan. Now, they belong to Satan by the permissive will of God. God has allowed Satan to have it. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's referred to as the God of this world. Uh, in Ephesians 2.1, he's referred to as the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
And so uh, God, by his permissive will, has allowed Satan to rule the kingdoms of this world. Uh, that's how you explain the Adolf Hitlers of the world. Uh, that's how you explain the Benito Mussolinis. Uh, that's how you explain the Fidel Castros. That's how you explain the Mao Te Sung uh, 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 type of individuals that come to power. Uh, the Joseph Stalins that murder millions and millions and millions of their own people. How does that ever happen? Because by God's permissive will, Satan is the ruler over the kingdoms of this world. Uh, Jesus told Pilate, uh, uh, he says, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. But now, but now, right now, Pilate, is my kingdom not from hence. What did he mean by that? Right now my kingdom's not here, Pilate, but someday it's coming. You see, in Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, it says, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. They're not His kingdoms right now, but someday they will be. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And in Revelation 19, 11, heaven opens up. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to descend with the armies of heaven and he's going to take the kingdom by force. And the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. But notice this, Satan is trying to offer these kingdoms to Jesus prematurely. Prematurely. He's trying to offer it to him prematurely. It's not time yet. Why is it not time yet? Because Jesus' hour of suffering has not yet come. You see, before uh, there could be peace, there first has to be righteousness. Before there could be the crown, there first must be the cross. And Satan is trying to offer Jesus the crown without the cross. But a crown without a cross spells certain doom for you and I. And Jesus knows that. And so it says he showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You know what that is? That's the lust of the eyes. But Jesus understands that now is not the time. He understands he must first endure the cross before he can receive the crown and rule over the kingdoms. And so it says, uh, verse um, 10, verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I'm not going to worship you, Satan. I'm not going to worship you. If anything, someday you are going to bow your knee to me, and you're going to raise your serpentine hands up to God. And you're going to confess that I am the Lord to the glory of my Father. <laughs> I'm not bowing down to you, son. Uh, listen here. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Triumph over temptation. Triumph over temptation. You see, where you and I fail, Jesus prevailed. And here in Matthew chapter 4, it's literally jumping off the page for us as far as the steps we need to take in order to have triumph over temptation. And if we would practice these steps, we could have the victory in our Christian walk just like Jesus had the victory over the devil. Uh, notice, first of all, the first thing I'm heavy to notice is this. And I'll be brief. The first thing I'm heavy to notice is this. The first key to triumph over temptation is being led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. In verse 1 it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You see, there's nothing wrong with going into the wilderness of life. Just make sure that it was the Spirit of God that led you there. 
because the grace of God will never lead you, or excuse me, um, how's that saying go? Um, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot sustain you. I've always loved that saying. The will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot sustain you. And so the first thing to realize is this, is you need to be led by the Spirit. Look with me, if you will, please, at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, look what it says here, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you see that? If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. The first step, the first key to triumph over temptation is to be led by the Spirit. And when we are led by the Spirit, when we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so that's the first thing that Jesus did. He was led by the Spirit. Now let us go and do likewise. Number two, I want you to notice this. Not only was he led by the Spirit, but number two, he was ready with the Scriptures. He was ready with the Scriptures. Um, in Psalm 119, verse 11, Come over to Psalm 119, verse 11. In Psalm 119, verse 11, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus was ready for the temptation because of the scripture that he had hidden in his heart. And that's what you and I need to do. If we are going to have triumph over temptation, then we have to have Scripture hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against God. Now, we are all tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three general categories of sin. But that doesn't mean that we're all tempted by the same sins. You know, for example, uh, I know that some people have a terrible time with alcohol. And alcohol is just something that I'm not tempted with. You know, uh, even before I got saved, I drank alcohol, but I never liked it. I never liked the smell. I never liked the taste. I just was not a fan of alcohol. There's some people that maybe they're predisposed genetically because of their parents being alcoholics or whatever else. But there's some people, they struggle mightily with alcohol. Um, so we're not all going to struggle with the same things. Uh, where I struggle is the lust of the eyes as far as, you know, uh, uh, pornography and things like that and trying to keep a clean mind and a clean heart. That's where I struggle. Some of you out there, you probably don't even have that struggle. And so we're not all the same as far as what we're tempted with. But those three general classes are still the same. So what you have to do is you have to know yourself as far as what triggers you, what tempts you. And you need to get in this book and find out what the Bible says about those things. And then you need to memorize scripture. Uh, listen, uh, a computer. Uh, I've got a computer sitting over there uh, you know, on the, on the bed. And uh, the, the computer uh, is, is a tremendous tool. It's, it's much smarter than I am. But you know what? A computer is only as good as what you put into it. It's only as good as the data you put into it. The same thing with your brain and your mind and your heart. Um, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, if alcohol is your problem, then you better find out everything this book has to say about alcohol. And you better memorize verses that deal with the subject of alcohol so that when the tempter comes to you and tries to get you to take that next drink that's going to take you down a path of drunkenness that will take you out of the will of God, you need to be able to come at him and say, Oh, no, Satan, it. Is written. Uh, if your problem like me is with, with lust, 
then you've got to memorize scriptures that deal with that subject and prepare to do battle so that when the tempter comes and he tempts you with whatever temptation, you can come right back at him and say, it is written. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And so he was led by the Spirit. He was ready with scripture. And then number three and finally, he resisted the devil because of his submission to God. Look with me, if you would, please, at James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. In James chapter 4, James chapter 4, look at uh, James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, years ago in uh, 1991, uh, I was on a, a deployment. Uh, I was the squadron corpsman or, or medical person uh, for VMFA 251, which was a Marine Corps F-18 fighter attack squadron. And so we did a Western Pacific tour at Westpac and we were home based in uh, Iwakuni, Japan. And from Iwakuni, we went to Australia, we went to Okinawa, we went to Korea, uh, we went all over the place. But uh, when we were in Iwakuni, uh, there was a missionary there, and he often would invite some of the young people over to his house for fellowship with him and his family. And uh, I was young and single at the time, probably 20, 21, thereabouts, 22 maybe. Uh, uh, this was 1991, so however old I, I was in 1991. But uh, we would go to his house and have Bible study, and sometimes we would, uh, we would sing some scripture songs. And he had taken uh, 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 James 4, 7, and he had put it to a tune, and it said, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You see, that's what Jesus did. Uh, Jesus not only was led by the Spirit, uh, he not only had hidden the Word of God in his heart and was ready with the Scripture, he resisted the devil. He submitted himself to God and resisted the devil, and the devil had to flee. Because the devil can't stand before a Christian who is submitted to God. He just can't. Now, I want you to notice something as we prepare to close here. In Matthew chapter 4, it says in verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. I want you to come over to Luke, to, uh, to the parallel account, Luke chapter 4, because Luke gives us an important detail that Matthew does not. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Look at verse 13. Luke chapter 4, verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him, watch this, for a season. You see, Matthew didn't say for a season. But Luke says that he departed for a season. Now what does that mean? It means eventually he came back. Eventually he came back. You see, that's the dirty little secret about temptation. A victory today does not guarantee a victory tomorrow because the devil's going to come back. But you know the opposite is true too. A defeat today doesn't mean you have to be defeated tomorrow. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whoso covereth his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesseth it and forsaketh it shall obtain mercy. And so certainly a victory today doesn't guarantee a victory tomorrow, but a defeat today does not mean that you have to be defeated tomorrow. You can have victory. We have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the triumph over temptation is a daily battle. Because I may win victory today, but
that there's going to be a fresh new set of challenges tomorrow. I may have been defeated today. That doesn't mean that I can't have victory tomorrow if I confess and forsake my sin. And so I just want to encourage you tonight. All of us are tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Adam and Eve were. The rest of us are. But so was Jesus. But Jesus won the victory. And through Jesus, we can have the victory as well. And so I just want to encourage you tonight to be led by the Spirit, to be ready with the Scripture, and to submit yourself to God so that you can be able to resist the devil. And if you'll do those three things, you too can have triumph over temptation. And so I want to thank you for uh, tuning into the broadcast tonight. I, I pray that the Word of God has uh, been a blessing to you. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed uh, the singing as we all sang together as far as the great hymns uh, of the faith, uh, the time that we've uh, spent together uh, in prayer. And uh, we just uh, continue to ask God's blessings upon each one of you, uh, that God will keep you safe uh, during this current uh, crisis uh, with regards to this virus that he'll keep you safe and keep you healthy. And uh, we look forward uh, to the coming day where we can all gather together in person uh, once again uh, back uh, in our local churches. But uh, once again, on, on behalf of Pastor David Gibson uh, and the fine folks of True Vine Baptist Church, uh, we thank you so much uh, for tuning in this evening, and uh, we hope that you'll tune in uh, for our next broadcast uh, when that time comes. But let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Amen. Our Father in God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. Father, we thank you for this time that we've spent in the Word of God. We thank you for the example of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as far as how he had triumph over temptation. And Lord, we know that through Jesus we have victory also. And Father, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be led by the Spirit, Lord, to be ready with the Scripture, and Lord, to submit ourselves unto you that we might be able to resist the devil when temptation comes. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Please watch over us and bless us now. And Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you until we meet again, my dearly beloved. Amen.